Let me invite you this morning to take your Bibles and turn with me in the Gospel of John to John chapter 14. We're going to pick up and consider the next I am statement as we're walking through the seven glorious statements of Jesus in the Gospel of John. And of course, every time Jesus says, I am, uh, it is a direct connection back to Exodus chapter 3 when God sent Moses to Egypt to tell Pharaoh, let my people go. And Moses said, well, who, and whose authority am I supposed to say I'm coming? And God said, you tell them that I am, the great I am sent you. And so when Jesus says, I am the bread of life, I am the light of the world, I am the good shepherd, I am the door, I am the resurrection and the life, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and then down the road, the last in the series, I am the vine. When he says this, he is de definitively declaring himself to be God. He is revealing and explaining God to us. In essence, when he says, I am all of these things, he's saying, I am God and you can trust me. So we live in an age that is eager for experience, right? I mean, that's where social media really has taken off from in terms of documenting our experience. Now, let's don't bash on social media for just a minute, right? Some of us go, hey, you know, they got all these... Instagram, Instagram and TikTok and all this stuff, just post pictures everywhere. My grandparents did the same thing. They just had to take 30 pictures before they developed their film to find out whether or not they had one good enough to go into the scrapbook, right? And so a, a social media wall really is just a modern-day scrapbook uh, is, or picture album is, is what that is. But we live in an age that's eager for experience. As a matter of fact, for many Christians, the final validity of the Christian walk is not what you believe or how you live, but what you've experienced. And I'm not saying that that's good. <laughs> I'm just saying that's kind of the, the genuine reality. Now listen, sometimes the personal experience I have with a company or with an organization leaves me a little wanting when it's over with. Can I get a witness? Anybody ever had to talk to the cell phone customer service department? If you're in the customer service department at a cell phone company, I, I'm sorry. I, I probably I owe you, right? I mean, think about it. We, I've changed cable, phone, and insurance companies because of bad customer experience. Now, I've left restaurants and never returned because of bad experiences. I mean, when the personal experience leaves me wanting, I, I'm likely not to go back. I mean, it's just kind of the reality, right? And so you, you're sitting there going, yep, I can relate. I, I can relate. Maybe you're like me. You've had some less than stellar experiences in life. Let me ask this. What about with God? What about with church? Maybe this morning you say, uh, you know, I'm not particularly religious. Maybe you've even walked away from the faith because of what you describe as a poor personal experience. And so this morning I want to give you a reason to reconsider faith. More specifically this morning, I want to give you a reason to reconsider Jesus. You see, Jesus came to introduce something brand new to the world and for the world. Not, Jesus is not religion 2.0, but he's something new. Jesus is not an extension of something old. He's the start of something new. Luke chapter 22 and verse 20. And this is going to seem a little odd because uh, that's Luke 2, 20 on the screen, um, which is Jesus' birth announcement. So just listen. <laughs> Luke chapter 22 and verse 20, Jesus, given the, the account of the Lord's Supper in the Gospel of Luke, this is what he said. He said, this cup, he holds up the, the cup with the fruit of the vine, the juice of the vine, and he says, this cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. No more animal sacrifices. No more festivals. No more priests. Jesus did it all. The Christian faith is not all of that plus Jesus. The Christian faith is Jesus, period. All of that pointed to Jesus, right? And he said, I didn't come to abolish all of that. He said, I came to fulfill it and fill it full of life. He gives meaning and significance and purpose, right? All that we saw, all that they were looking forward to is found perfected in Jesus. So pick up with me here in John chapter 14, beginning in verse 1. Jesus says, don't let your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. 
In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? If I go away and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself so that where I am, you may be also. You know the way where I am going. Lord, Thomas said, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will also know my Father. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Verse 8, Lord, said Philip, show us the Father, and that's enough for us. Jesus said to him, have I been among you all this time, and you don't know me, Philip? The one who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I speak to you, I do not speak of my own. The Father who lives in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Otherwise, believe because of the works themselves. Father in heaven, this morning would you give us understanding of you, God the Father, of Jesus, God the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, God, the Holy Spirit. Father, will you help us to see our lives in light of who you are, in light of what Jesus has done, and in light of the faith you're calling us to trust you with. Help us in Jesus' name, amen. So here's the big idea. Faith that is based on personal experience alone eventually buckles under the weight of personal experience. Faith that is based on personal experience alone eventually buckles under the weight of personal experience. Now in John chapter 14, let's talk about the context. Let's talk about there, the disciples and Jesus. Let's talk about their context. What, what may be a little surprising to us is that this claim in John chapter 14 first appears not in the public square not in a debate with religious rivals. Rather, when Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no one comes to the Father except by me, it is in a private dialogue in a gathering with his disciples, with his closest friends. Jesus' disciples at at this point uh, had begun to be fearful. They had begun to panic. Their heads were spinning. I mean, think about it. In John chapter 13, one of their very own had left as a traitor. Also in John 13, Jesus announces to them that he himself is leaving them for good. And now at the end of chapter 13, he informs uh, them that Peter, and Peter would have been kind of considered the elder statesman in the group, right? He would have been looked at as Peter's chief among them. He now, Jesus now informs them that their, uh, their team leader will deny Jesus three times. I mean, think about this. All that they knew, all of the, all of the comfort, all of the, the, the clarity, all of the consistency of Jesus being physically present with them, all of that is now being challenged in their hearts and their minds. They've watched one of their very own go out from under. They're hearing Jesus say, hey, I'm leaving. I'm leaving and I'm going to leave you. And then Peter, Peter's going to deny Jesus? Into this comes confusion. I mean, think about it. Their heads are spinning. They're confused. How can this be? Why would this be? There's confusion. There's emerging fear. And into that, Jesus speaks a word of comfort and reassurance to his followers that they have not been forgotten. Into the midst of their chaos and their confusion and their doubt, Jesus says this, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Is that evangelistic? Absolutely, because all of Scripture is evangelistic, because all of Scripture points to Jesus. But in its context, Jesus is speaking a word of comfort to his followers. I mean, think about it. Jesus said, I'm I'm going away. And verse 4, you know the way where I'm going. And then Thomas who's known as Doubting Thomas, Thomas asked a question that everybody in the room was thinking and everybody here today is thinking, how do we know where you're going? How do we know how to get there? When I first, uh, before I started driving, Benning, I 
I didn't understand, I didn't understand what those signs on the side of the road were that had like the state of Georgia with a number in it. And so here's what I thought. I thought that you had to memorize every route. Like I thought that I had to memorize and, and just like know how to get to my grandparents' house and get and I kept and how to get to I thought, how in the world am I ever gonna know how to get anywhere? I don't know. I don't know it all. Right? Then my dad brought home this little booklet to study for my uh, learner's test, and inside of there, there was this explanation that these signs on the side of the road, that if you start out on Highway 17, Georgia Highway 17, if you'll just keep following, every time you see it, if, you just, if 17 takes you where you're going, just stay on 17. I was like, whoa, that's brilliant, that's genius. Kudos to the man or the woman that came up with that great idea. It was a lot better than the idea that I had of having to memorize the entire Rand McNally map. See, you, you've grown up in an age where you just, you Google everything. Google is a verb, right? And you just map it. You just say, hey, talk to your phone. Show me directions to such and such. And then you just plug it in and go. We didn't have that. We had a glove compartment full of maps. You know what I'm talking about? Y'all can see this. Y'all remember? You open the glove, and like 32 maps fall out of the glove compartment. There's no room for anything else in there because we've got the entire map section from the visitor center at the state of Florida in the glove compartment. We've got a map for the state of Idaho, and my family was never anywhere near Idaho. Why? And so basically, Thomas says, I don't know how to get there. I, we don't know where you're going. How, how did we get there? Can you hear that? After three years with them, this was the best that Thomas had to say? After three years of personal discipleship and pouring into them, this was Thomas's response to Jesus? You would think by this time that when Jesus said, hey, I'm going away and prepare a place for you, Thomas would say, that's right. By the resurrected power of the Lord Jesus Christ, he has paved the way. He is the first fruits of the grave. Jesus will be raised, and we will follow him. That's what you would think Thomas would say by now, but Thomas's response is what? Where are you going? I mean, you're just like, oh. So it's a very classical education thing here. Jesus gives them a very easy to remember statement. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. It's like repetition. It's, re it's encouragement. So in their context, their little world is getting flipped upside down. Their security blanket is being taken away. This past week, let me talk about just the little corner of the world that I live in, right? It's not a pity party. I'm just saying, in the little corner of the world that I live in, in the past week, a friend of mine's father died tragically. My hero in ministry was outed for sexual abuse. Two conversations this past week with men regarding sexual purity in their lives. Conversation with a friend who is navigating parenting the teenage years, and if you've got teenagers or you've ever parented the teenage years, you get it, right? Sometimes you just have to take the hurt to bed and hold it in your heart between you and the Lord. And as if that was not enough, then the school shooting in Texas that unfolded and now just continues to unfold in such a tragic follow-up to being at the local emergency room early in the morning Thursday with a church family to get in a phone call that my own daughter had had to go to the urgent care two and a half hours away you can't get there fast when you're a parent and then you just don't get there at all sometimes conversations in the past week with with caring solutions core health care pregnancy center in Warner Robins and listening and digesting what is going on in their ministry and listening and seeking to understand what potentially the, the front lines of, 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 of that kind of care of a pregnancy center may need to be if, if Roe versus Wade is overturned this summer. Seeking to, to hear and hearing the stories of the, of the women and the men coming through there and being ministered to and hearing the stories of all of that, right? There's, there's highs, but there's a lot of lows. Conversation with the rescue mission of middle Georgia. Again, a lot of highs and a lot of lows. 
Conversations with church planters this week as we seek to discern where Cross Point's next cross, church planting partnerships should be. And you hear the stories, and you just wonder, is that going to work? How's that going to be? Is it going to make it, right? And so I'm just saying, in my little corner of the world this week, by the time I got to the weekend, I was overwhelmed and beyond exhausted. By Thursday afternoon, I just sat down, and, and I had not cried, but you, just, you can feel the exhaustion, right? And my mind was swirling all these things. What in the world is going on? Why is all of this happening? Where does my faith fit into all of this? And the banner over everything that follows in this text begins in verse 1, where Jesus says, let not your hearts be troubled. Listen, Jesus as the way, the truth, and the life is first about comfort and peace and assurance for his followers. I don't know about you, but in the midst of a topsy-turvy, a lot of highs and a whole lot of lows, in the midst of all of that and in the midst of the turmoil and the, 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 the storms of life, I need an anchor. You, you understand what I'm saying? I, I need to be able to know that I know that I know because my eyes and my emotions and my feelings are telling me one thing. So what is it I'm going to believe? Where am I going to anchor into? And so Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life is first about comfort and peace and assurance for his followers. These are not fighting words. They are soul-quieting, heart-feeding truth. Comfort first, not controversy. Now, this may be the most exclusive statement that Jesus makes, right? I mean, the Bible is exclusively true all the way through, but this may be like, you know, if you're putting somebody on trial, you just say, hey, did you really say that you, you, you're the only way? Right? You see what I'm saying? I'm like, Jesus got really, really exclusive here. And so to a, to a lost world, that doesn't see truth as absolute and doesn't see God and Jesus through the lens of faith, that sounds very, very, very mean. But to God's people, to God's followers, to Jesus' followers, these words are gold. Because Jesus told us we would embrace, we would endure hardship we would be persecuted for his name's sake and for his righteousness sake and so in the midst of all of that in the midst of the confusion in the midst of our head spinning in the midst of all of that we are able to remember that Jesus said he is the way he is the truth he is the life it's true what's true all of it about Jesus everything that he said I can depend on him Amen. and so when Jesus says in in the first couple of verses, he says in verse 2, In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would, have, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? Jesus said, would I have lied to you? Verse 3 says, If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself so that where I am, you may be also. Now, here's an interesting thought. When we read this passage and it says, Jesus says, I go to prepare a place, what, comes to, what, come, what image comes in your mind? For me, it's a construction site. You know what I'm saying? Like you can drive through a neighborhood that's being built and there are houses in different stages. You know, some it's just the ground been cleared off, some they got a foundation poured, some have been, been uh, you know, framed up, some are dried in, you know what I'm saying? But you can just drive through a neighborhood and you see the different phases and stages, you know, or you drive by any construction site and, and we watch these things come up. It's under construction, it's being built. And I think a lot of times that's what we think. Hey, Jesus is going away because heaven has still got to be finished. No! No. When he says, I go to prepare a place for you, this is not construction in heaven. It's about crucifixion on earth. What? <laughs> Jesus' presence is what prepares heaven. Jesus is who will make heaven heaven. So when he says, I go to prepare a place for you, the preparation and construction is done in his death, burial, and his resurrection. There's, there's not some construction scene where it's, it's, you're not still here because God hadn't finished off your room yet. No. Jesus said to the thief on the cross that day who responded to him in saving faith, what did Jesus say to him? He said, today, this day, you will be with me in paradise. 
Our confidence is in the gospel, in the good news of Jesus Christ. That Jesus is moving his disciples from troubled to trusting. He says, let not your hearts be troubled. That's the negative. And then there's the positive. He says, you believe in God, believe also in me. You see, faith is the key that unlocks the door to joyful Christian living. Faith, trusting Jesus, is still the antidote for fear today. But not just the general trust, a couple of really big specifics. And let, that's where I want us to spend the rest of our time this morning, is on these two specific statements from Jesus. The first specific is this. Jesus is enough. Jesus is enough. Either Jesus in his glory and his death, burial, and resurrection, either Jesus is sufficient or he's not. And God's people have got to stop living in, some, in, in the in-between somewhere where he's sufficient enough when things are going well, but I'm not so sure that he's sufficient enough when things are not going well. He's either sufficient or he's not. And John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3, focus on the truth that God has made provision for life and for death and for eternity in Jesus. What this text focuses on in the second coming, right? Because we hear that. He goes, I go away to prepare a place for you, and I'm going to come again and take you to be with me. What this text focuses on in the second coming is not a return to heaven, but a reunion with Christ. Jesus is enough. He's enough for your salvation. He is enough for your marriage. He is enough for forgiveness and reconciliation. He is enough for your parenting. He is enough for your life and for your relationships. He is enough for your education. He is enough. Enough. Now listen, it's not about a return to heaven. It's about a reunion with Christ. You might feel at this point and say, hey, preacher, those are some wonderful comforts. Those are nice platitudes. That sounds good. But they are really far away. They're, they're so far away, they're either at, the, at my death or Jesus' second coming. And for most of us, we'd like for one of those to be further away than the other. Right? There's an unholy turmoil in our hearts and our lives. I mean, we relate. We can identify with Thomas. Jesus, I don't understand. I don't understand what you mean. I don't understand what's going on. What, what do you mean you're leaving? Where are you going? How are we going to get there? How will we find you? What's your, what's your forwarding address? So there's an unholy turmoil in our hearts and our minds. And what's causing the unholy turmoil in our soul right now is that for some seasons, we don't know what's best for our family. We don't know what's best for our children. Our marriage can be fragile. Our health can be failing. Somebody say, well, you know, I can't stand my job. You say, I'm lonely. I mean, if Jesus doesn't want our hearts troubled right now, is there some encouragement for faith closer than the second coming? Is there something between now and the return of Jesus that is that anchor? Yes. Jesus himself. I'm not, I'm not anchored to a hope in an event. I am anchored to the reality of a person named Jesus. So what comfort do we find in confessing Jesus as the way? When Jesus says, I am the way, he's speaking of reconciliation. Reconciliation. A way supposes two points. A way is the path from one point to another. I'm here, I want to go there, this is the way that I'm going to get there. And in this case, when Jesus says he is the way, it is the way from where we are to where God is. Jesus spans the distance. Jesus spans the gulf between us and God. I mean, our determination to do things our own way is pretty incredible. But Jesus, the good shepherd, leads us in a way out of weariness, leads us out of dryness, leads us 
to green pastures, leads us to the paths of righteousness, leads us by the still waters. Wherever you are right now today in this moment in your faith journey, wherever you are, that's where you are. And the only way from where you are, whether that is drawing near to Jesus or walking in guilty distance or walking in utter disobedience, wherever you are, the only way closer to God, the, Jesus is the way. It's not, hey, I need to do more of this, or I need to try harder, or I need to get this out of my life. No, I need to anchor to Jesus. Jesus is the way. What I'm really looking for, Jesus is the only way to get there. And so Jesus is how we get on the way of righteousness. Jesus is how we stay on the way of righteousness. And Jesus is how we return to the way of righteousness when we stray. Jesus does not show us a way. That would be works. Jesus doesn't say, hey, go that way. Hey, do this. He doesn't, you know, like reroute it and give you three options. That would be works. That would be Jesus saying, hey, go try it on your own. No, Jesus says, I am the way. You want to get there? Come to me. Come to me. Come through me, Jesus says. What comfort do we find in confessing that Jesus is the truth? If Jesus as the way is about reconciliation, then Jesus as the truth is about illumination. Illumination. We don't need more truth. We have sufficient truth. We don't need more revelation. We have sufficient revelation of God and his truth. What we need is illumination, right? Understanding of that truth. And so Jesus is completely reliable in all that he says and all that he does. Jesus reveals, he shows us the truth about God. Jesus shows us that God is personal. He's not some impersonal force in the universe, right? Not the yin and the yang. It is God. He is, a, he is the person, God the Father. He shows us that God is personal. He shows us that God is holy. And he shows us that God is merciful and loving. The truth is that God is a personal, holy, loving God. How do we know this? Well, the scriptures tell us this. The creation testifies to this. But Jesus, who is enough, reveals, explains, and demonstrates it to us as the way and the truth. Growing in the Christian faith is not about information download. I think for so long this is, um, you know, kind of a programmatic plan in the life of church. We turn discipleship into like a, like a college situation or high school at best, right? You've got to pass these classes, and, you know, once you pass these classes, then somehow you've, you've achieved discipleship. Well, listen, if you're not living it out and fleshing it out and looking and thinking and talking and acting and looking more like Jesus, then all you did was gain some information. There's no life transformation. And that usually comes about because Jesus is not enough to us. So growing in faith is... It's not about information download. It's about transformation by the truth. It's that we see life through the right worldview. And we understand life through the lens of the truth of Jesus because that is what aligns with reality. So what comfort do we find in confessing Jesus as the life? If he's the way, that's reconciliation. If he's the truth, he's illuminating. He's, he's given us understanding. And if he's the life, it's the theological term regeneration. We were dead in our trespasses and sin. Jesus awakened us, called us out of our deadness, and transferred us by faith from death to life. Jesus didn't die so that bad people could be good. Jesus died so that we who are dead in our trespasses and sins might be made alive together in Jesus. 
Mere physical existence is not enough, and it matters very little. Jesus offers in himself a life that is qualitative. It's not just that life in Jesus is eternal in the sense of, of quantitative, you know, that, that it lasts forever. It is qualitative in the fact that it is distinctly different than anything that you and I understand. Here's what happens. Jesus gives us his life. He says, don't you know that I and the Father are one? The Father is in me, and I'm in the Father. And this relationship that the Father and I have, this life that I live, this life that I enjoy in relationship with the Father, that's the life that I give to you by faith in the Son of God. And so Jesus is enough. He's the way, the truth, and the life. The second specific anchor this morning is this. Jesus is enough, and God is with us. The emphasis of verses 7 through 11 is, I think, crystal clear. Here it is, seven, verses 7 through 11, Jesus and the Father, they're one. <laughs> I mean, that's what he says over and over. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Philip, I, don't you know? Jesus and the Father are one. Jesus' presence is the presence of God the Father. So look at verse 8. Lord, said Philip, show us the Father, and that's enough for us. Jesus, he says, all right, Philip, is it really enough? Verse 9, have I been among you all this time and you don't know me, Philip? The one who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? Jesus says, I've shown you the Father. God is here. He is as close to you as I am to you right now because the Father and I are one. Let me go a step further. We didn't read the text, but look down in verse 16. Jesus says, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another. He will give you another counselor to be with you forever. He, this counselor, is the spirit of truth. The world is unable to receive him because it doesn't see him or know him, but you do know him because he remains with you and will be in you. So let's go one step further with this. Jesus said, I'm leaving. I'm leaving the earth. But hold on. I'm going to give you another helper. The word another there literally means of the same kind of the same substance, the Father, the Son, and now the Holy Spirit. So the presence of God abides in the people of God by the Spirit of God. And so Jesus is in heaven with the Father interceding for us at God's right hand, and Jesus promises another helper. This helper is the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God is, dwells in the life of the Christian. That's God. God is with us. He's not left us. He's with us. Listen, it's not just that God is bigger than the circumstances and the trials that we face and the hard times that we live with. It's not just that he's bigger than those things. God is with us in those things. Therefore, Jesus says, do not let your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. God has made provision for you in everything in Jesus. Jesus is the way to God. He is the truth about God, and he is the life that you desire and long for. Listen, fellowship with Jesus is a prerequisite for fellowship with God. You cannot have a relationship with the Father without coming through the Son, Jesus. That's what he says. Nobody, no one exclusively comes to the Father except through me. Everyone is a creation of God, but only those who have trusted Christ as Savior, only they are the children of God. Maybe you're familiar with the account, Peter in the boat, storm, and Jesus saw Peter, excuse me, Peter saw Jesus coming to them on the water, and Peter said, hey, I, let, me, let me come to you. And Jesus said, come on. 
Like Peter in the boat in the storm, you and I must fix our eyes on Jesus and walk to him. The secret of our public confidence is, our priv- is in our private devotion with Jesus. The secret of our public confidence is found in our private devotion with Jesus. Because faith that is based on personal experience alone buckles under the weight of personal experience. Matthew chapter 5, and verse 17. Jesus said, don't think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish but to fulfill. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or one stroke of a letter will pass away from the law until all things are accomplished. Listen, if the Old Testament was an assignment, Jesus accomplished it. If it's a math problem, he solved it. If it's a plane, he landed it. Jesus was born under God's covenant with Israel to fulfill that covenant, to end it, and to replace it. And he replaced it with a new covenant in his blood, the gospel. Not between God and a nation, but between God and individuals. Jesus offered something better for everybody. I mean, what would it look like in your life and in my life if we were to begin with a simple yet challenging proposition? Here it is. What if we started at this point? God is real and has made himself known so that I can know him and trust him and live for him. I mean, what if we just started with that proposition? God has made himself known so that I can know him, so that I can trust him, and so that I can live for him. God has spoken. In no other way could we have known him. Though the universe declares the glory of God and bears witness to his power, it alone could never tell us of the full glory of God and his love for us. And though history tells us of the sovereignty of God, history can never explain what Christ was doing on the cross. And though our conscience bears witness to the morality of God, it can never teach us how to live holy and love rightly. Unless God speaks, we would never know him or his love for us. I mean, to us, the universe and history and the conscience are really just one big undecipherable hieroglyph until we have God's Rosetta Stone, Jesus himself. For it's in Jesus that we go, that makes sense. For it's in Jesus we go, oh, that's what it means. For it's in Jesus that we go, ah, that's what God is like. That's what love is like. That's what redemption is like. That's what forgiveness is like. That's what holiness looks like. Jesus is God spelling himself out in a language that you and I can understand. Jesus is the speech of eternity translated into the language of time. The inaudible has become audible and the invisible has become visible and the unapproachable has become accessible. Now, speech is a vehicle of communication. And communication can get garbled at one of two primary places. It either gets garbled at the source or it gets garbled at the point of reception. It either gets poorly communicated from the beginning or it gets poorly understood on the other end. I I read a story of President Franklin Roosevelt who once conducted an experiment at the White House. He was hosting an event. He was in the receiving line at the White House, and as people passed by entering to greet him, he mumbled these words to them. He said, I murdered my grandmother this morning. He said that people were so in awe of being in the presence of the president that most of them never even understood or heard what he said, and they responded with things like, Wonderful, Mr. President. We're praying for you, Mr. President. God bless you, Mr. President says that the ambassador to Bolivia passed through the line, and he apparently understood and heard what the president said. And so when the president said to the ambassador of Bolivia, I murdered my grandmother this morning, the ambassador to Bolivia leaned over and whispered in the president's ear, I'm sure she had it coming. (laughs) When God speaks, he does not stumble or mutter or stammer. 
God is the perfect communicator. And he has spoken in clear communication that Jesus, the Son, is God. He is God's ultimate communication because he is God's perfect representation. Jesus perfectly represents God to us, and the Scriptures perfectly represent Jesus to us. Speech is also a vehicle of salvation. God's perfect communication has as its goal the salvation of all sinners. Jesus says, I am the way. I am the truth. And I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus longs and God longs for you to know his salvation. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. On this, God has spoken. That Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through Jesus. Those are convicting words because they are exclusive words. But more than that, those are comforting words because they are exclusive words. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. With every fiber that is within my being, I plead with you this morning, man, woman, boy, or girl, if you have never trusted Jesus as your personal Savior and Lord, I plead with you that today you would trust Christ. Jesus is the way. He is the only way from where you are to being right with God. He is the only way from where you are to eternity in heaven. He is the only way from where you are to the forgiveness of sin. He is the only way from where you are to the peace that passes all understanding. Maybe a simple prayer in your heart, in your life, just honest before God, this might sound like this. Dear God, I know that I have not lived for you, and I understand that I am a sinner separated from you. And I believe that Jesus is your son. He is the way. He is salvation. And today, God, I trust Jesus. If that's the need and the desire of your heart, right where you are in this room and online, would you pray and trust Christ? It's not the words, it's the sincerity of your heart, the genuineness of your faith. Maybe you'll come in just a moment as we sing and say to Trevor or myself, hey, I need to trust Christ, or I've trusted Christ today. We want to help you to keep walking in that relationship. Maybe, though, you can identify with Thomas, and you'd say, hey, my world is spinning, and I'm not sure what. I hear the comforting words of Jesus. He is the way. He is your truth. He is your life. Let Jesus be enough and walk and embrace the truth that God is with us in Jesus. Father in heaven, help us. Help us to walk and respond to you in faith. In Jesus' name, amen.